Listening to Dispatch Radio, sponsored by theglobaldispatch.com. Well, welcome back to Dispatch Radio. Um, earlier this week, um, there was a letter published in the scientific journal Nature that has caused quite a stir amongst the scientific community. And in a nutshell, it's it's saying that there's a group of scientists that are interested in performing controversial experiments on the uh, bird flu that's uh, circulating in China right now. It's called avian influenza H7N9. And to date, it's infected 134 and killed 43. Here to try to sort this out is Dr. Vincent Racaniello. He's a professor of microbiology and immunology at Columbia University. Hello, Vincent. And welcome back to the show. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me back. Uh, yeah, you were, as soon as I saw the story, uh, you came to my mind immediately. Um, so tell me if I got this right. So we got about 20-odd virologists, and they want to do some manipulations on this virus. Is that it in a nutshell? Yeah, that's basically it. The H7N9 virus, which, as you know, just emerged into people this year, uh, seems to have some potential for infecting more people. So these virologists want to do experiments on it, and they wrote this letter to let everybody know exactly what they want to do. Sure. And these experiments are called gain-of-function experiments. In the simplest possible terms, can you try to explain what that means? So a gain-of-function simply means that you take a virus and you change it in some way so it does something new, so it does something that it didn't do before. That's all that means. It's quite simple. So you could, for example, take this H7N9 virus and make it resistant to an antiviral drug. That would be a gain of function. Sure. And uh, I read your post on Virology blog um, the other day, and clearly you are pro gain of function experiment. And I guess my question is, and for our listening audience, why would anybody want to do this? So, yeah, just to really understand how this virus works and really any other virus, we do gain of function studies all the time. Uh, we don't we don't make a big deal of it. We don't write letters telling the world that we're going to do them because that's not the way science works. Uh, science works by just doing your experiments. Uh, we do this because we would like to see uh, what kinds of changes would lead to a gain of function and what would be the consequence. So in the case of this virus, uh, these investigators want to make the virus drug resistant, as you know, there are a couple of antivirals that you can use if you get influenza, candy flu, relenza, and these investigators want to make the virus resistant. And the reason they want to do that is to see if a drug-resistant mutant would have any properties that would make it scarier in people. So there is really a goal to these experiments. They want to know if you change the virus, what might be the consequence uh, for people. And yeah. as I said, these are done all the time, but these virologists decided to tell the world about it. And, and that's probably because it's kind of deja vu uh, to 2011 when they they individually um, did the H5N1 experiments, which caused all kinds of controversy. Yeah, as you know, as a result of that, there was a moratorium on uh, H5N1 transmission research for a while. And part of the, uh, the goal of that moratorium was to try and increase telling the public what you're doing with this virus. And I think these authors, being part of that whole scenario, decided it might be a good idea to tell the public ahead of time what they're going to do. So they're sort of playing politics with this. I suppose in a way. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, as a scientist, I wouldn't do this because I think you get into trouble. As you, as you know, the press has blown up over those letters, and you, the headlines are incredible. Sure. And I, I think it's better to do the experiment. And uh, if it works out, publish it, and then explain why you did it afterwards. Okay. Now, there's plenty of arguments against performing such experiments. Um, some people are saying, I want, and I want you to respond to each one, that uh, these engineered strains could be accidentally or deliberately uh, released from the lab, sparking a flu pandemic. What do what you say to that? I, I think this is very, very unlikely. The way I view it is you have to balance what you might get from an experiment versus the potential danger. And in this case, the potential benefits far outweigh the dangers. These experiments would be done under high containment. The likelihood that a virus would escape is really, really low. Plus, whenever you do a gain of function, the virus always loses something in exchange. 
and in the H5N1 gain of function experiments where they adapted them to ferrets to aerosol transmission, that was a gain of function. And what those viruses lost was their ability to cause disease when they spread by that route. So I don't I don't worry about a, a dangerous strain getting out at all. I think that likelihood is is really negligible. Okay, and uh, an- another uh, critique is. Uh, some are saying that the animal models, such as ferrets, um, yeah, they can provide some information as far as risk of transmissibility and pathogenicity. However, how do you extrapolate that to humans? You're right. Now, this is something I have always contended. You cannot make predictions about what will happen in humans based on an experiment in an animal like a ferret or a guinea pig or whatever your chosen animal model is. But you still have to do these experiments because they, they provide you other kinds of information. For example, the ferret transmission experiments with H5N1, they, the result of those were a series of genetic changes that allow the virus to transmit in the air from one ferret to another. Those don't predict the changes that might be important in humans. However, those changes give you an idea about how it works to make a virus better to transmit in the air. In other words, what is the function of these changes? And I think the function is conserved between animals and humans. So they do provide a lot of information. They're not predictive, but they provide what we call mechanistic information about very specific aspects of human disease. Yeah, and kind of a follow-up to that, I saw in one AP report this week, um, uh, one scientist who is... uh, definitely a critic of the experiments, said, um, you know, we tried this with the H5N1 two years ago, you know, we got nothing out of it. You know, should we do all this work if uh, it's not actually going to make a difference? Well, I would totally disagree with the conclusion that we got nothing out of it. I would send that scientist to my blog. I wrote a series of posts <laughs> about what we learned from those H5N1 experiments. We learned a great deal. We were, we were shown things that we've never understood before about what makes a virus able to transmit in the air. So I argue that, that we're going to learn a lot from these kinds of experiments. Yeah, and uh, if you weren't aware, Vincent, uh, I just saw a press release from Hong Kong today, and they have a suspected uh, H7 uh, N9 case in, uh, in China right now, and uh, so that may be number 135. Yeah, I saw that on your blog this morning. Oh, great. Fantastic. you got to love that. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Vincent uh, Racaniello, Dr. Racaniello, has a fantastic blog called Virology Blog. If you have any remote interest in, in, in the science of virology, this is the place to go. He did a fantastic article um, concerning this these uh, gain-of-function experiments, and um, he makes a very strong case um, – for performing them, and uh, I just found it great. Um, and also, if you're interested, uh, he has a very uh, good Facebook page, too. It's, it's called This Week in Virology. Am I correct? That's right, facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. Yeah, and that's a good place to go to for information. And uh, all right, Vincent, well, I appreciate you coming on and, and clearing the air on this and uh, telling us what you think. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. Could I plug my Coursera course? I'm sorry? I teach a course on Coursera, and I'd like people to know about that. Oh, okay. Uh, Go ahead. So, Go for uh, it. I, te- I teach a virology course. It's free on the Coursera site. That's Coursera.org. And you can find a link to that uh, on my blog, virology.ws. It just started last week. It's free, and we take you step-by-step step through understanding virology. So I think you'll like it. Well, that's great. And I have a lot of uh, uh, Facebook fans on uh that are very interested in these kind of topics. So uh, hopefully that'll get spread around around the globe because it, it is a global thing. All right, Dr. Vincent Racaniello from Columbia University, uh, thanks for joining us on the show. Robert, always great to talk to you. Thank you. All right, same here. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, well, uh, fantastic as always, Bob. And uh, it's really awesome to know that uh, Dr. Racaniello is following your work as much as you're following his. That's fantastic. I know. That caught me off guard a little bit, so I'm uh, really pleased. Uh, and considering that this uh, this particular story has gotten a lot of, I mean, a lot of the stuff we talk about here on the show doesn't get necessarily the coverage it should. Uh, this has got probably more coverage than it should have. And um, 
uh, not being uh, a virologist by training, um, it's good to read and listen to uh, what uh, Dr. Racaniello has to say, and even reading the comments on his blogs, because not everybody agrees. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to transition into some pop culture stuff. I know Mike Smith from Media Mics is going to be joining us here in a few minutes, but let me go to Oprah Winfrey.